Hey everyone, this is Chris. Uh, as you can probably tell, looking at the table in front of me, this is not Lord of the Rings. Probably also saw that in the video thumbnail, so no surprises here. Uh, but I was feeling a little bit unenthusiastic about picking a quest to play Lord of the Rings for this week. Uh, and I had just finished sleeving up cards for the Circle Undone in Arkham. I thought to myself that it might be fun to do one full Arkham campaign for the channel. Obviously, this one just started, so if we somehow manage to do one scenario every time they get released, it'll, it'll still be like five or six months before we wrap this up, uh, but that's fine. So we're going to start today with the prologue. This is going to be spoiler heavy gonna read the text and do all those nice flavorful things that I always avoid with Lord of the Rings. Uh, and then after the prologue, I'm gonna talk about the investigator deck that I built so that we can just sort of hop to it in the next video with the first scenario. With that being said, if you are here, thanks. Hopefully you also enjoy some Arkham and give you a sense of how this game plays if you haven't tried it for yourself. So let's get to it. Prologue. Disappearance at the Twilight Estate. Sunday, November 22nd, 1925. Arkham, Massachusetts. Though All Hallows' Eve is nearly a month past, a grim melancholy lingers throughout the town. Each morning, a thick fog permeates the streets. Nights are beginning to grow longer, and if you ask around town, you'll hear people swear that it's getting darker too. But despite the gloomy mood, progress continues in the sleepy town of Arkham. The election of Nathaniel Rhodes to the United States Senate has upstanding members of the community feeling optimistic about the town's future. And tonight, at his well-appointed estate in French Hill, a man named Joseph Meiger hosts the Twilight, the Silver Twilight Lodge's Charity Gala, an annual members-only event that will turn deadly for several attendees. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Meiger announces, raising a glass of champagne in a toast. A hush descends on the room until only the crackle of the fireplace and whispers of gossip can be heard. Allow me to welcome you all into my home for this year's charity gala. We have some very upstanding citizens here tonight, and I thank all of you for your hard work and generosity. Cheers and murmurs of agreement fill the room. Many of the guests raise their glasses to Valentino, one of the most esteemed members of the lodge this year, who sits at the guest of honor table, which is nearest to the fireplace. Yosef's assistant, Jerome, blends into the wall behind Yosef, discreetly checking his pocket watch. In another corner of the room, the head housekeeper, Penny, walks from table to table, filling empty glasses and collecting dirty salad plates. Each of you has done great deeds in the name of the Silver Twilight Lodge and our historic city, Yosef continues. Next year, we will continue to shoulder this burden and do what must be done for the sake of progress. Jerome steps forward quietly, interrupting Yosef's speech with the unass unassuming confidence that comes from years of trusted service. He taps Yosef lightly on the shoulder and shows him the time. I'm afraid I'm already out of time. Thank you all very much for attending. Yosef concludes, bowing. Polite applause rises from the audience, and Yosef walks briskly toward the parlor, followed closely by his assistant. Two servants collect coats as latecomers trickle into the manor, and Gabriella, Joseph's head of security, watches over the entrance with hard eyes and a clenched jaw. Has Mr. Sanford arrived? Joseph asks curtly, tapping his polished leather shoe on the floor. I'm afraid not, Jerome replies, flipping through the last pages of the estate's guest book, but he should be here any minute, Mr. Meiger. Good. I want there to be no problems whatsoever when he arrives. Am I understood? Yosef calls out to Gabriella, 
Make sure he's well protected. Gabriella nods, putting the handle of her 45 in her shoulder holster. Yosef turns his attention back to his assistant and have Penny make sure the main course is kept good and hot while we wait for Mr. Sanford's arrival. Not a single slice is to be served without his presence. Not even for Mr. Rivas, sir? Jerome asks, glancing at Yosef over the rim of his thick glasses. Yosef pauses for a minute, considering. Pour Mr. Rivas another glass of champagne, and I am sure he will not complain. Also, I am still waiting on those accounts I asked you about earlier today. Don't forget, Yosef says, clapping his assistant on the shoulder before walking back into the banquet hall. Jerome nods obediently and heads upstairs. Soon after, the dark mist would appear, and nothing would be the same. Are you going to break? Or are you going to sit there admiring the cue ball all night? You ask with a mocking smile. Your opponent sets the ivory ball back on the table with a sigh. I can't help myself around ivory. You know that, Tino, Adam replies. You rarely see Adam Gensler except during lodge functions, but you prefer his company to that of the stuffy business types who make up most of the lodge these days. He makes his shot the sudden clattering interrupting the din of conversation. Your shot, Tino, and do try to avoid hitting the nine ball first. You're always so overeager. Adam chuckles as he moves to the other side of the table, making way for you. That was one time, my friend, one time, you roll your eyes. Truth be told, you've enjoyed coming to these events for the opportunity to give back to the community not to hobnob with Arkham's gentry. But hobnobbing has its perks. You lean over the table and clear your mind as you line up your shot. The room falls silent as you block out the clamor and the music, focusing all of your attention on the one ball and the corner pocket. You hold your breath and strike the cue ball. It clacks as it hits its target, and the one ball drops effortlessly into the corner pocket. There, you see? It is only then that you realize the silence around you is not just in your mind. All of the light and warmth has been sucked out of the room. Adam is gone, along with everyone else who was present just moments before you took your shot. Hello? You call out. A dark mist coils about your ankles as you walk around the billiards table. If this is a practical joke of some kind, it is in awfully poor taste, you remark. The only response is the deep growl that emerges from beneath the table. Morbid curiosity compels you to look underneath it, at which point a dark hound pounces onto your chest, savagely clawing at your torso. You react instinctively, pushing it off of your body as hard as you can. It lands on the billiards table, causing it to collapse under the creature's weight. You slowly back up as the creature rises to its feet once again and jumps off the broken table, its hollow eyes gazing into your soul. All right, so that's the setup for this prologue here and the introduction to our temporary protagonist, Valentino, who is very rich, as it turns out. I have the map all set up here, although now that I am looking at the video rig, I'm gonna shift slightly so that we can see this location that was, was hiding off of the side here. It only connects to the halls in the middle, but we can tweak the map a little bit just to make space. We also have this, this shadow hound here that you heard about in the introduction. Apparently, despite being spectral, it is heavy enough to break a billiards table. I do not understand how that works, but that's all right. 
Uh, and Valentino has a lot of cards that deal with money. So that is how we're going to attempt to make it through the scenario. All right. Reading some of the cards on the table. Agenda. Judgment. XX. There is no escaping fate. Hear the call and be reborn. Anytime we place doom, horror is taken by investigators. So eventually, no matter what happens, we will lose. The disappearance. Something terrible has invaded the home of Josef Meiger. In the moments that follow, you scramble to survive. Any clues that we have picked up before we are eliminated get dropped onto the act instead of on the location that we are at. And that is sort of the victory condition here. Uh, we can't win. These temporary investigators are guaranteed to die in the prologue. But we are trying to get as many clues as we can. And we start off here in the billiards room, which is haunted. The game room's warmth and laughter have been replaced with a sense of quiet dread. Tendrils of black mist slither from underneath the collapsed billiard table, twisting and swaying along the floor in a formless dance. And with that, I think we will get started. Uh, my plan here is to try and evade the Shadow Hound and pick up this clue. Uh, Shadow Hound will kill me pretty quickly, and it has Retaliate, and it triggers Haunted Effects. So this prologue might not last very long. Uh, but I have three actions, so let's just go for it. All right, so first things first, action number one. We are going to evade this Spectral Hound. I'm uh, going to commit this cunning to the test. And I have 10 money over here. These are my fancy glass tokens that I made at some point. Action trackers as well. Uh, but I have 10 resources, so we get plus 3 to this evade. Uh, and we are looking at 7 against 1 to evade the Hound. That is a zero. So we have successfully evaded the hound and we can move on. Cunning goes away. Uh, I have not read the back of all of these, but I think for the sake of action advantage, and I'm, uh, but if I move too far, then the spectral watcher is gonna come and get me. Uh, so, so, we are going to investigate this location. Uh, I'm currently investigating at three, up against three shroud. Uh, and if this haunt goes off, I discard an asset or take a damage. That's not too bad. I should also say that I am uh, playing with a variant for the Chaos deck that I actually really like with these cards, uh, especially for the sort of tarot theme of the Circle Undone. Uh, and basically it's just going to be Gloomhaven rules. So I'm going to keep flipping cards off the top until I reveal uh, either the Elder Sign or the Tentacle token, at which point I'll reshuffle before we continue drawing any more. It smooths out the randomness a little bit and also guarantees more appearances of those tokens uh, without the challenges of me having to fish my hand in a very loud bag of tokens or shuffle this deck all the time. Uh, so I'm going to investigate. That token is minus three, which means there's five tokens that will fail and a whole bunch that will succeed. And if I fail, I won't be very happy. But I do have enough money to use money talks if I want. Mm, I can't really succeed with opportunist. Money talks would put me at five versus three. Hmm. 
I mean, this is all right. We're going to, we're going to use well connected to give myself uh, five and I am going to investigate this location. We're going to hope the skull is minus three. Uh, and if we fail, we would double haunted, I believe. So that's always exciting. Oh no, right, different. So would haunt. Uh, I can play sure gamble to make this a plus three, which I think I will do. Because I really do not want to lose this well connected yet. So sure gamble turns that into plus three instead of minus three. So eight against three means I have collected this clue. That's action number two. Uh, and action number three, I am just going to move into the trophy room. Trophy room reads, flanking this door are two rotting deer heads mounted on the wall. They stare at you with hollow, dead eyes. And on the other side, rotting animal heads adorn this room's wood paneled walls. Once a display of power and sovereignty, now macabre displays of death and decay. You cannot help but feel their empty eyes drill through you as you explore the room. Great. That's a lovely place right here. <laughs> uh, well, it's got a clue on it. We have used our third action for the round. So I think that means we are done. Uh, enemy phase, the Spectral Watcher is going to step up into the halls. The Shadow Hound is going to ready. He won't hunt this round, but he will soon. And we move to upkeep. Pick up while well connected, get my ninth resource back. So at nine, money talks is a four base skill. So maybe that's okay. Well, we'll, we'll see what happens. We do also, of course, at the beginning of the next round have the mythos phase, which puts a doom on judgment. And I either take one damage or one horror. So let's take that horror instead of damage. And I draw one of these cards. Trapped spirits. Cast agility three for each point you fail by, take one damage if your location is haunted. For an additional cost, to commit one or more cards, you must resolve the haunted ability. All right, um, so I'm just gonna try this and take the damage. Uh, we're not gonna have to do this haunted ability, so that's all well and good. Hey, there's the elder sign. All right, well, that is a success. My base agility is four. It also means I get two free resources. So we are back above the threshold for all of the good things that care about money. And now I have to shuffle this deck. Uh, good news, that should mean that investigating this location is very easy. Uh, bad news, we're about to run into the Spectral Watcher and, you know, have some fun. I have three, three actions before that. So let me, uh, let me investigate first. Starting at three, four, five. Um, Yeah, let's, let's investigate now. So we got uh, three, four, five, and I will commit opportunist for six. 
basically means there are very few things that will cause me to fail this. Pretty much just the tentacle token. So I won't be haunted. Hopefully. All right. Uh, so six up against two. All right, minus two makes it four up against two. So I do lose opportunist, but I also pick up this clue. And that was action number one. I have to spend action number two to move into this room, engaging the Spectral Watcher. Victorian halls. The warm rays that once illuminated these halls have faded into beams of cold gray moonlight that shine through floating motes of dust and wisps of dark mist. There are no clues in this location, but if we investigate anyway, we lose an action if we fail. Uh, so that's fun. Lots of fun. And this Spectral Watcher is going to do some fun things. All right, so we are here. Uh, I mean, at this point, I basically have to move into another room. Um, I suspect that the office is pretty good, just given the fact that you can't uh, you can't sort of progress through that way. So let's go up into the office. There are two clues on the office. All right, but the office. The lone door atop the second floor staircase has rotted and decayed as though hundreds of years have passed. The once polished oak is now stained and warped. It could collapse at any minute. And on the inside, a thick, oppressive haze fills what was once an impressive office. Cracks fork up and down the wooden paneling of the walls, and the bookshelves surrounding Yosef's desk sag with the weight of rotten, decayed books. Perfect, I love books. Uh, there are two clues in this location, and it is four shroud, which, uh, yeah, I suspect that that was a, a decent choice. I bet there's two clues in here as well, just based on the structure. Uh, and I did take the damage and the horror from the opportunity attack from the Spectral Watcher. Uh, but that was my third action for the round, so we are basically done. Uh, into the enemy phase. Shadowhound gets one closer, and the Spectral Watcher is going to attack yet again. Uh, so I can evade him in order to uh, in order to investigate more freely, or I could just attempt to investigate twice and not really worry about it. I have some serious boosts, and I know I'm not actually going to survive. So I think perhaps that is what we will do. I do get yet another resource, uh, although it's basically impossible for us to get above the five threshold. Having 12 now means that money talks puts us at a base skill of six, so I'm glad I saved those. Uh, let's move on to the next round. Get another doom on judgment. It causes me to take either a damage or a horror. Choose to take horror. And I draw a wraith. Okie dokie then. Also a hunter enemy, so that's what this scenario is all about. And it haunts its location. So I think that I am going to have to evade this wraith, uh, because otherwise I can't investigate more than once. Uh, good news, of course, is that evading does not trigger attacks of opportunity, 
and the wraith is not alert. Uh, so this should be fine. Let's use well connected to evade, attempt to evade this wraith. Uh, so we are looking at a base skill of six versus the two to evade this wraith. Minus two, totally fine. So I won't take that extra horror. And that was action number one. Uh, and now we have to investigate and just accept that I am going to be gone by the end of this round. And hopefully, fingers crossed, I will have cleared the office of clues. I don't know why I'm running around racking up clues instead of trying to get out of the house, but... Uh, Apparently you can't get out of the house, so why not? Why not? All right, so action number two, I'm going to investigate. I will take one damage and one horror. Uh, I have two more of each. And I'm going to use money talks so that my base for this test is six instead of three. And we need to beat a four. Haunting is gonna make us choose and discard a card. That's not too bad. Uh, so let me use cunning. That gets me to six. Oh, I can't do that, can I? So is it better for me to, so it's three and three either way. Uh, so, all right, we're, we're going at six up against four. A zero means I get this clue, and I do not have to trigger that haunted effect. Still have lots of money. Uh, and with the third action, I'm going to investigate again. I do take one last opportunity attack, bringing me to four damage out of five. Six horror out of seven. And once again, I've got uh, six one way and six another. So let's just use money talks. Get myself base six for this investigation. Uh, once again, six against four. Hey, it's another zero. All right. So that was action number three. I have claimed my four clues. And in the enemy phase, the Spectral Watcher does one damage and one horror, which is precisely enough to defeat Valentino Rivas. Dumping these four clues onto the disappearance. So. Mr. Sanford, thank you so much for coming. I know you are a busy man. Your presence at tonight's meeting is very much appreciated. Joseph shakes Carl Sanford's hand firmly as he speaks. Sanford merely nods. I know you've only just arrived, but I have some private matters to discuss with you, if that's all right, Joseph continues, his narrow eyes shifting back and forth between the men flanking Mr. Sanford. Very well. The elderly man nods to his two enforcers who step aside to give him privacy. He cradles his hands behind his back, his stature impressive for his age. What is the matter? Yosef leans closer. It's here, sir. It's here in this very house. There is a quiet pause between the two men, and then Carl Sanford smiles. We don't get any experience. I record in the campaign log that four pieces of evidence were left behind, and then we move on to the rest of the scenario. Before we do that, I'm gonna pick up some of these cards just to, to get them out of the way so we can talk a little bit about the deck that I am going to be playing. Wait, 
which I have left over on a completely different table. So, one second. All right, so I cleared a few more cards out of the way while I was doing this just to, to give me a little more space. Uh, but my plan for this campaign as a pure solo endeavor is to kick it off with Ashcan Pete. Uh, and this is just because of some of the cards that we got in the Circle Undone box that I think are really interesting, especially starting out as you are with sort of lower stats in exchange for Duke with Pete. Uh, just to sort of show you the good boy uh, who I thought I lost because he was stuck to the bottom of Pete. Uh, Duke, our loyal hound, is he starts in play and he's a really effective way to get up and running with uh, strong fighting and investigation immediately. Uh, but the cards that are new that I want to focus on a little bit are this Meat Cleaver and Able-Bodied. Uh, so Pete decks tend to not run a ton of items um, and a lot of that historically has been because you spend your resources to fuel the fire axe or something like that. Uh, also, Duke, of course, is not an item, so able-bodied is probably going to give us the full benefit most of the time. And we also have this new weapon, Meat Cleaver, which gives you plus two fight if you have... Uh, fewer than three remaining sanity. If you kill an enemy, you get sanity back. <laughs> and you may take damage to deal an additional, or take horror to deal an additional damage. Which I, I think is potentially really interesting. Uh, so Duke obviously is more straightforward, but given the low sanity that Pete has, uh, having a way to sort of lower it yourself is really nice. Also, it gives you an attack that allows you to fight without having to use Duke for this. Uh, I mean, you can always discard cards to ready him, but that can get pretty expensive as you go along. And five, or sorry, four base attack with two damage is what Duke offers you. So there's, there's value there. One of the things that I think it also synergizes with really well uh, is these desperate skills, which I'm probably actually going to go through and add a few more into this deck. Uh, but the idea being if we sort of use cards and abilities that get Ashcan's sanity down a little bit by adding a little bit of horror, maybe throughout the campaign taking a little bit of mental trauma, uh, then we can use these desperate cards very easily because four skill icons is very nice. Also, of course, got my favorite reason to play Survivor with Lucky. We do have a few sort of backup options from the Yorick toolkit with the Gravedigger's Shovel and the Lantern. And I'm just going to sort of make a big old pile of cards up here as I go through this. Uh, I'm also trying something that I haven't done before with Pete, uh, but it's potentially really interesting. So if you're not using Duke to investigate, or you're sort of relying a little bit more on Pete, uh, you can use those discard effects to ready more things. And one of the cards that I want to try with this is field work. I think it's a lot of potentially interesting value to get out of being able to possibly field work more than once in a round. So like you could move into a little location that has a clue, get a boost for your combat, punch an enemy, and then ready field work to do something like that again later in the round. Obviously, three actions sort of puts a damper on that, but, you know, you can use Duke to move. Um, and I'm curious. It's possible this is horrible, and we're going to swap out fieldwork really fast. 
but we'll see. Uh, other splash cards, we have Inspiring Presence, uh, just to sort of get a little heat off of Duke, because he is so very good. Uh, and I also have pulled in Vicious Blows, just because that extra damage can be really impactful. We'll see how much that comes up in the initial stages of this, uh, but we're definitely focusing a lot more on fighting and investigating than something like Rita or Wendy, it focuses more on evasion. All right, I think that's gonna wrap up this first video. Thanks for watching everyone and stay tuned for scenario number one with Pete in the near future. Hopefully a Pete that looks something like this deck and not a complete overhaul, but if it happens, I'll let you know in that video. Thanks for watching.